let's let's talk through some things today. I really feel strongly. I was in a conversation. Uh, I think it was Tuesday. Uh, it was a long week, so all the days kind of run together. But I believe it was Tuesday. My wife and I were talking to a friend of ours. A, uh, she's a member of Antioch West, and we were talking with her about some things. And and in conversation, she made a statement that kind of just stuck at me. And then for the rest of the week, it just kind of keeps kind of building, if you want to call it that. And in the course of conversation, she made the statement, and she tied it to something else that was said to her. Uh, but she talked about the fact that your story matters. Your story matters. And all of us today have a story to tell. All of us have our own story, our own narrative our, uh, of our life. And I want to focus on that today because ultimately your story matters to Jesus Christ because you matter to Jesus Christ. And I want to focus on that today and talk about the fact that your story matters to Jesus Christ. But before we do that, let's uh, take a moment, if we can, and let's read a story out of the Gospels. Uh, we're going to read out of Luke chapter 7, and um, we're going to scroll down to the bottom of Luke chapter 7, or if you are, I say scroll, I don't know if all of you are, watch, are doing a, a device, but if you have a device, you're going to scroll. If you have an, a Bible that you're open, you're just going to find it on the page where it's at. But for my app right now, I am scrolling down. And some of you have asked real quick, some of you ask, have asked, what app do I use for the Bible? Um, there's a ton out there, a lot of good ones, and a lot of them are free. Uh, one of the ones I use that's real simple is just called the U version. Uh, in fact, I think if you type in U version in the App Store or Google Play, uh, the it literally the the logo I think is a cross and it says Bible underneath. But the U version is great. It's got a tons of different translations. It's got a ton of different daily devotional reading plans. It's really easy to follow. Very easy to navigate. So some of you have asked me that. Um, and um, uh, I, I just use the U version. I've got probably eight different Bible apps, at least on my on my uh, iPad. Uh, but when it's just something quick and easy to get to, I usually go to the U version. It's right there, and it's got all kinds of cool different translations and things for you. You can take notes, and if you have multiple devices, you can kind of bring all your notes together. But uh, it, it's 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 a it's a good it's a very easy user friendly app. So again, some of you have asked me what what I use, and it's just simply the U version. But again, uh, Bible's a Bible. So um, whether you're using a U version or another Bible app, or you just got that old fashioned thing called a Bible book, uh, imagine that, right? Um, but uh, whatever. So uh, Luke chapter seven, we're going to read uh, a story out of this passage uh, at the at the end of Luke chapter seven. It's a very powerful story. Uh, it's just got the imagery of the story is wonderful, and I want to I want to look at it just for a moment today. Luke chapter seven, verse thirty six says, "Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask." of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet, behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with her, with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet, and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Be careful when God says, hey, I want to tell you something. You're like, okay, God, bring it on. Tell me. Because, you know, we often think God's going to tell you, you know what? I'm about to just, you know, make your life amazing. I'm about to, you're about to win the lottery. And it, well, I think he kind of expected, you know, here he is, the, the posh, religious Simon and he's kind of saying, you know, if this guy was real, real he would know that the, this woman who's doing all this is, she's a sinful woman. And he says to him, you know, hey, uh, I got something to say to you. And he goes, of course, Lord, say on. And this is what Jesus said. There was a certain creditor who had two debts. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, 
which of them will love more? You know, Simon's still not getting it. He's still kind of in his pious religiosity, and he gives the answer again. I can kind of see him giving sort of like this flippant remark like, you know, come on, Jesus, give you... Give me something more challenging, because this is obviously a very silly question, and I obviously know the answer. And he says, I suppose the one who he forgave more. Of course. Duh. You know, you're not really that great of a teacher, because you're asking me these silly questions. But then Jesus came back and said to him, you rightly judge. Good job. You rightly judge. But here's why. Then he turned to the woman and said to, said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I have come to her. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many. He, he didn't, Jesus wasn't trying to make her, you know, he wasn't saying, you know, it's, she's, she's sin, but you know, it's not that big of a deal. He said her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loved little, little, same loves littles. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table began to say to themselves, who is he who forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now this is an astonishing moment and such a beautiful image of something here. Because when we stop for a moment, and, and if you've ever read the Bible, and if you've ever taken any time to read any, of, any portions of Scripture and, and um, taken time to dig into sort of the characters of the Bible, especially the characters in the Gospel and the story of Jesus Christ, when we say the Gospels, we're talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books are what we uh, group together, and we call them the Gospels. It's simply the Gospels because it proclaims the Gospel. And the Gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we call those four books the Gospels because those books deal directly with the, the, the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus Christ. And so um, in the Gospels, it is filled with amazing characters from all walks of life. It's not just about Jesus, but it's about all these characters. But sometimes I think we forget something when we read the Bible. We forget when we read the Bible that these people were not just fictitious characters brought to life on the stage by some creative playwright or some creative uh, architect of a story that has created these uh, people out of nothing to kind of put them in Jesus's path to kind of enhance his character, to kind of bring the light, the power of Jesus Christ. So let's create a woman with uh, an alabaster box. So let's create a blind man, or I'm going to create a character that's deaf, or I'm going to create a character that has demon possession. I'm going to create a character that's uh, dead so we can create him back to life. These were not created stories. Now, when we read the gospel, we get just a small snapshot of these people's lives. In this, in this woman, there's a lot of debate, and I don't want to get into this today. There's a lot of debate. There's two references to this same moment. There's a lot of debate if this was the same woman, was it different women, whoever. That, that's not the time or place to get into it today. The bottom line is this. We don't know a lot about this woman. We don't. We are capturing a small snapshot of her life, a moment. We have this moment where basically she, Jesus comes over to the house of a Pharisee and she hears about it. She comes in the house. Now, just to put some common sense spin on the story for a moment, if she came into the house of a Pharisee and she was a sinner, she would not have been allowed to come in the house unless she had some kind of relation to the people that either own the house or in the house. Now, there's a lot of speculation on who she was and what her relationship was. We don't know. The scripture really doesn't tell us. Was she Simon's daughter? Was she Simon's niece, sister? I, who knows? But obviously, this woman who was an outsider, an outcast, and very descriptive, even Jesus said, she was a woman with many sins. We don't know what that sin is. Some have speculated of what she might have been and what she might have did. I, um, you know, the bottom line is it doesn't matter what she's done. The Bible doesn't categorize sin. That needs to be established here today because I know a lot of you with your life and where you've been and things you've been involved with, you're like, yeah, man, 
you know, how can God ever forgive me? Because I did this and that person did this. And, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I stole a million dollars. They stole a pack of bubble gum. So, of course, you know, God's going to forgive them. I don't know if he can forgive me. God doesn't categorize sin. There's, there, God doesn't rank sin. God doesn't go, well, okay, well, you only did that, so that's easily forgiven. But you did some really bad stuff. I'm not sure I can forgive you unless you really work harder. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says that all sin, all sin in God, there's no categorization of sin, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So even a small sin in our category, we categorize it, we do. I mean, come on, let's be honest. We understand how God can forgive someone who told a little white lie. I just don't know if God can forgive someone who's murdered. Can he for God doesn't look at it that way. Sin is sin. We do, but God doesn't. That's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. The point I'm trying to make is, is that whatever this woman did doesn't matter. But the fact of the matter is she was categorized as someone who had committed sin. Great sin. A lot of it. Don't know what it is. It didn't matter to Jesus. He didn't say, she's a woman who has done this. And no, by the way, she's done that and she's done this. She said, well, maybe he didn't know. Baloney. The Bible says that God knows all things. 1 John 3.20 said, God knows everything. God knows our heart and he knows all things. Go read it. 1 John 3.20. So God knows all these things. And, and later on, we find that even in other situations, he knew, he told this guy, uh, Nathaniel, he said, I saw you sitting under the tree. Before you even came to me, I saw you underneath the tree. And this guy's like, what? Where, where were you? Were you hiding? In, like, I didn't see you. There was nobody around. Where were you in the bushes? And, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you're not getting it. I, didn't, I wasn't standing there, but I saw you already because I'm, 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 I'm God. So God knew what her list of sin was, but ultimately he wasn't trying to rat it out. Can I just stop for a moment and tell somebody, God's not interested in exposing you. He's interested in forgiving you. Now, if you're writing, if you're, if you're, if you're taking notes or you're, or you're taking mental notes, you need to remember that. Somebody needs to write that down for you. You need to remember that. God's not trying to expose your sin. He's trying to forgive your sin because the Bible says there is no greater love than the love of God, right? God is love. John tells us, the, the, the epistles of John tell us that God is our first John. First John uh, 4, verses 7 and 8. God is love. This is God. God is love. You cannot separate love and God because the essence of God is love. And the Bible says this, that love covers a multitude of sin. So God is not interested in uncovering your sin. God is interested in covering, covering your sin. This is not, and I say this with respect, and I'm not trying to knock anyone's belief system or their practice of religion, but you don't have to come to me to tell me all of your sins. Because i got to be honest with you, I don't really know. I don't really want to know all the stuff you've done. I don't really want to know. I Because mean, honestly, truthfully, i got enough stuff in me that I've got to work through, that I've done, I don't really need to know all the stuff you've done. Because frankly, you don't need to tell me, I can't forgive you. I don't know who I'm telling you this, but some of you believe, well, i got to go tell. No, no, you don't have to tell me. Look at these hands. Can you see them online? Look at these hands. There are no nail prints in these hands. If you could see my forehead today, there's no scars on my forehead. If I could take off my shirt and show you my back, there are no scars on my back from where I was beaten. I've got no scar in my side from where a spear thrust in my side. I've, I've got no nail prints in my feet today. I don't have any scars that I carry that connotate that I died for you. I didn't die for you. He died for you. It wasn't my blood that was shed for you. It was his blood that was shed for you. He and he alone is the forgiver of sins. So you don't have to confess your sins to me. The Bible says if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't have any room in that scripture for the man called Joel Wright. In case you don't know, that's my name. He didn't say, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whoever tells Joel Wright all of their sins, they will be forgiven because Joel Wright will allow them access to God. You don't need me to get to Jesus. Hey, I'm here to help you find him on your own. Right there in your living room, right there in your car, right there in your bedroom, wherever you're at today. God wants to fellowship with you, but you don't have to come to me. I'm a man. I'm not God. He and he alone is the forgiver of sins. 
So let's get that straight. Number one, God doesn't categorize sin. Number two, you don't have to come to me and tell me your sins. Because frankly, I don't really want to know your sins. That's between you and God. And I tell you right now, you don't want to know my sins. Because trust me, I've got some doozies. I mean, I've got some, I've got some good ones. I mean, I've got some real good juicy ones. I'm not talking about, yeah, well, I just said a bad word. Or, you know, I just had a bad thought. No, I've got some good ones. I've got some ones that will, you go, wow, man. Ooh, that's good. I mean, that, ooh, you know. I wish I could tell you today, you know what, I've, I've, I've never done anything that's, I've never done anything quite wrong. I'm, I've, I've lived a perfect life. I, I blew that really early on in my life. I'm going to let you all right now. I took care of that really early on in my life. So I, 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 it's been downhill for a long time. But thank God for his grace and mercy and the blood of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. So kind of be honest with you. God's desire is to cover sin. So when Jesus looks at this woman and says, hey, she is has many sins, he didn't call out what those sins were. So let's not speculate what those were. However, we can put together, number one, she had to have known somebody else because she had access in the house. Number two, they didn't kick her out. Number three, she got close to Jesus. And number four, she had this overwhelming outpouring of expression of love and gratitude towards him. To the point that she was weeping, weeping with admiration and love for Jesus Christ that her, her tears became so great that she could actually wash the feet of Jesus with her tears. And this wasn't a little tiny tear that was, I mean, she was weeping to the point where she could wash his feet and then she dried it. And then on top of that, there's this other moment of beauty where she had this alabaster box full of special fragrance. And I wish I had time to go into all of that, but it was a precious, it was, it was, it meant, I mean, that box she carried was one of her greatest earthly possessions and she broke it and anointed his feet with that fragrant oil. What a beautiful moment captured. But that's the problem. It was a moment. And so I look at that moment from an outside perspective or I look at that moment reading it here in scripture and it is a beautiful moment. It's powerful. Can you imagine? And you know, what's one thing about the Bible that we miss is you can't capture some, some of the senses of the Bible, right? You know, touch, taste, uh, touch, taste, uh, smell, hearing, seeing. You know, you're limited by the page, so you have to use your imagination. But I, I wonder what it had been like that day to, to been in that room and to hear her tears, hear her crying, hear her, her love flowing out of her, and then when she broke open that alabaster box to smell the wonderful fragrance of that room. What an amazing moment that must have been. But in the whole moment of this, we had these guys sitting over there looking at all this going, hmm, if this guy really was who he says he was, would he really let this woman who is a sinner touch him? And so Jesus is kind of going back and forth with these guys. And Jesus looked at him and said, I got, I got, I got, a, got, a, got a question for you. Two people owe money. One owes 500, the other owes, other owes 50. Neither one of them have the ability to pay, but both of them have their debts completely forgiven. Which one do you think is going to be more thankful? And he said back to him, well, of course, I think, you know, suppose the guy who had more, he said, absolutely. He said, this woman has, a, has many sins. So therefore, because of her many sins, she loves greatly. Now here's the beauty of that moment. We look at this and, and, uh, we're just capturing a moment. We're just getting a snapshot of time. But we don't know what it must have been like for the, lead, for the moments leading up to that. And, and uh, we don't know about the days, the weeks, the months, the years that were lived out in this story for this woman. We are capturing her at this moment of transformation. But what about the story that led up to this moment? What about all the sleepless nights of laying in her bed, whatever that might have been for the evening, with those same tears that she 
wash the feet of Jesus with soaking her, her blanket or whatever she was laying on, soaking the ground underneath her head. What about all those nights of emptiness? What about all those nights of loneliness? What about all those nights of pain? What about all those nights of regret? What about all those nights of hurt? What about all those nights of hopelessness? You see, the story doesn't tell us that side of things. It just it captures this beautiful moment of redemption, this beautiful moment of forgiveness, this beautiful moment of transformation where she literally comes out of this horrible situation and Jesus says, you are forgiven and may your faith make you whole go in peace what a wonderful moment but what about the story leading up to that moment you see when Jesus looked over at this man named Simon and he explained to him the situation the way he explained it to Simon Jesus was telling us something greater than are just the words on the page because he was telling Simon and he just alluded to it a little bit without c conveying the dirty, dark secrets of this lady's life. He looked over to Simon and said this. He said, Simon, her sins are great and they're many. You see, Jesus was acknowledging something by saying that. First of all, he was acknowledging to her, there's no reason to run and hide, I already know. Oh, you get you got to get that. That's so powerful and beautiful right there. Don't miss that point. Jesus looked at, was talking, and he said, look, go back and read it again. It's right there. Look, he said, do you see this woman? And he, he looked at, right, go back to uh, verse number 43. You got to watch this. This is powerful, folks. You got to, I want you to get the imagery of this moment because your story matters. Your story matters. And here's why it matters. Get the imagery of this moment. He said, Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Got it. Now watch this. Verse 44. Get, you can get a Bible out and you can read this with me because you got to see it for yourself to know what I'm saying. I'm not making up. Get the image. I'm not, I'm not reading into what's not there. I'm letting, the, I'm letting the Bible. There's two ways to come to the Bible. There's to go to the Bible and let the, and, 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 and let the Bible... Uh, you, you know, you take your own beliefs to the Bible and let the Bible kind of confirm to you what you already believe, or you go to the Bible with a blank slate and let the Bible talk to you. So we're not telling the Bible what to say today. We're letting the Bible talk to us. Now watch what happens. Verse 44, Luke chapter 7, verse 44. Watch what it says. Now read it. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon. Notice that. You got to get that. I know that sounds silly. So he, he looks at this guy, right? Get the, let's back up the story because you got to get it because your story matters. And these little details are going to be the things that tell us why my story matters to God. Because this woman mattered to him. Her story mattered to him. Now watch this. So here's he comes over. He's eating. He got these, these religious, religious elite in there. These Pharisees. They're kind of sitting there with their kind of religious uh, elitism on, you know, sitting there all prim and proper. Uh, as if you know they've never had a bad day in their life and and uh, this woman somehow enters the room whether or not she knocked or walked in we don't know and she falls down at Jesus feet she's weeping I mean just this amazing moment she's weeping she's crying she's washing him she's kissing all over his feet and then she breaks open this uh, box of fragrant oil this aroma hits the room I mean just it I mean literally this moment is just it's this moment is in this is is captured in the entirety of this room now watch this these guys say right they say how can he really be who he says he was if he lets this woman do that and and he says I gotta tell you something and he says well you know say on teacher because I know you're gonna tell me how great I am and Jesus said hey if someone has five hundred dollars fifty which one would forgive more and and he said I suppose the one who so Jesus has this dialogue back and forth with them he's having a dialogue back with Simon this guy named Simon but then watch what happens the Bible says in verse 44 he turns to the woman and says to Simon I get that he turns to the woman he makes eye contact with her, but he's talking to Simon. But by talking to Simon, he's still talking to her. So he's not talking. He hasn't immediate. This is not an object lesson. Mm, tell me something. You got to get this. God's not trying to make an object lesson out of her. She's not a tool. She's not a prop. 
She's not a, 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 a scene played out in the drama of the, of the story. Uh, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar. This is, not, this is not an act. This is not a moment. This is not a scene. This is a real human being with real hopes, real dreams, real hurt, real pain, real issues. She's carrying all this stuff. So he's not trying to make this an object lesson so you and I 2,000 years ago can read, 2,000 years at later can read the, the words on a page of how the fact that this woman had such a beautiful act of love. He was trying to talk to her because she mattered to him. You matter to Jesus Christ. You're not just a name. You're not just a character on the canvas of this of this theatrical thing we call life. You matter. She mattered. She was not a character introduced by the writers of the Gospels that say, enter the woman into the scene. Let's get, can we, is there a way we can kind of get this whole story a little more, a little juicier? What can we do? Well, let's create a woman who has many sins. That's a good character to introduce. She's not somebody that just appeared off screen. She's not somebody that appeared behind the curtain. She wasn't brought on to play a part. She was real. She had real issues. She had real life. This wasn't a day, a week, a month. These were years of carrying that. She had gotten to the point in her life of utter hopelessness. You don't do what you do in that manner, in that situation, if you haven't reached a peak of absolute hopelessness hopelessness to be willing to walk into a place you know you're not welcomed and to fall down at the feet of somebody you don't even know and to have that kind of outpouring of love you don't do that because you woke up this morning and went yeah let me see what can i do today i gotta go to the market uh, i need to go to the well but i'd like to go probably down to the shop i need a new uh, i'd like to get a new uh, a new outfit because girl my stuff is old oh by the way uh, oh, I'll stop by Simon's house and see who's hanging around. And if there's somebody there, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them. It wasn't a moment. She didn't wake up that day and say, you know, this was something that was building. And somehow she heard wind of Jesus being at Simon's house because she either knew Simon, was related to Simon, whatever the case might be. She had access to Jesus because he was at a place she knew she could get into. And so this moment, right? The Bible says Jesus looks at her, but talks to Simon. That's like you and I right now. I'm looking, talking here. If someone was sitting here, I'm looking at them, but I'm really talking to you. Why? Because I want them to know that they matter. You matter, whoever's sitting here. Just in case you're wondering, there's nobody over there. <laughs> it's just empty. It's a wall. You matter. If I like, think saying that person, you know what you matter. I'm still wanting to talk to you, and I want to tell you some things, but if I just talk to you, I'm going to make them feel like they're not. You ever been a part of a conversation where you knew you weren't welcomed? I mean, seriously, isn't that, the, isn't that the, like, the most awkward thing? Let's have a moment here. Let's, let's, let's stop for a moment. Seriously, you ever been in part? It's, the, it's like the most awkward thing. You're in a situation, especially if there's only a couple people, and the person talking is constantly looking at that person, and, and, and you're like over there, and they never look at you. Kind of like, uh, why am I even here? Like, seriously. You ever felt that way? But what is it like when you're in a room and someone, even if there's multiple people, that pe someone's taking time and, you know, they look over at you, they make eye contact. They want you to know, hey, I, I care that you're listening. I, I want you to hear my story. I want you to hear what I'm saying. And 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 wouldn't it be awkward? And, and have you ever had this happen? It is an awkward situation. I've had it happen a few times. It's awkward, and if you've ever had it happen, trust me, you'll know what I'm talking about because it's awkward. You ever been in a room and someone's talking about you, but they're not talking to you, they're talking to somebody else, but they're talking to somebody else about you? Is that not the most awkward thing ever? Like, seriously. I mean, it's like, who, what am I? Like, do you guys not realize I'm in the room? You're just chatting away. Hello? That is the, I mean, it's terrible. So why is this important? Why is this little one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten words in this sentence, in this whole story, why is this important? Why is, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, why is this important? Because it's important for the fact that Jesus was acknowledging 
her. He was acknowledging her, and this is what he said. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. And he goes down the list of all the stuff that Simon didn't do, but she does. Now he's validating her worship. He's validating her worth. He's validating her sacrifice. He's validating the fact of what she's done. He's given her validation. She probably hasn't had validation in forever. She obviously has been used, based off the context of this, this is somebody that's been used to being judged prematurely. We were in the store yesterday. We went to Target. And uh, I hope this guy's not watching because I don't say this to be, uh, be funny. Although it's kind of funny, but I, I, I'm not trying to make a joke of it. We were in Target yesterday, and obviously it was Saturday, and obviously yesterday being the holiday that it was, it was an interesting time to be out. I'll just lay it at that. So we're in Target. My wife was having to pick up a few things, and so we're walking around the store, and we're getting some things. And and this guy came in, and 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 I, I wish I could tell you that it was because of the day it was, and he was doing this in conjunction with the day but based off the based off the way he was dressed and the way he was this was not his holiday attire it was obviously something he wore every day and this guy comes in and it was i mean first of all there was there was some amazing uh um how can i say this uh uh skill in his preparation to leave the house. He had he, he had this, um, he had a complete ring around his head. All of this was shaved down. So he had no hair all around here. But then he had this um, hair, his hair was straight up. And it was probably, oh, it was probably eight inches tall, six, eight inches tall. It's fantastically straight. And it was so perfectly straight, it created this perfect circle, and he had it cut, so it created like this ramp. First of all, it was a feat of engineering. It was phenomenal, because it would just stay there. And it was just, and then he had on plaid leather, leather pants. He had a chain, leather chain buckle belt thing going on. He had boots on with the soles that were about two inches thick. He had black and red, this is it, black and red plaid pants. He had purple shoes with heels that big. He had a leather jacket that had all kinds of special extra bedazzled things on him. I mean, this guy was dressed to impress. And you know what's funny? Everybody in that store, based off what they saw, we're making assumptions of what kind of guy that was. They were making assumptions of who he was and what he done. Whether fair or not fair, not getting into that. My point I'm making is, is that that happens so much. It happens to, we do it to others and we have that done to us. We get put into categories because of what we look like. We get put into categories the way we act or whatever the case may be. And so that fellow... People are probably already assuming what kind of guy he was, what, you know, his likes, dislikes. He might be literally, I mean, who knows? I mean, he, he, he might be, a, I don't know. I have no idea. He might sell pretzels. I have no idea what he be. He might just be a normal guy, but the base of his, of his characteristics externally, people are like, well, you know, that's kind of guy. And you could tell people were not really all that chummy getting next to him. I thought it was fascinating. I just couldn't keep my eyes off of him. It was just phenomenal. Because to me, I had all this kind of churning in me already. God was already dealing with me. So I was sitting here watching this guy and I was thinking, what's his story? Like seriously, what's this guy's story? You don't just wake up one day and amass that kind of collection of stuff, and you don't wake up one day. I uh, listen, you know, uh, we all have our cross to bear. But I, you know, I try to spend some time on my hair. I, I like. I have a guy that I go to. Uh, I've been going to now for a long time. This guy is he's such an amazing um, um, uh, hairstylist. He does great jobs. He's a perfectionist. I go to him because he's good. I don't. You know, I, I do. I like my hair cut in a certain way. I mean, I guess you, if I'm vain, forgive me for being vain. Help me that God will help me. But this guy, obviously, 
He went to some serious time and effort, and trust me, for him to get his hair to look like that, that was not something he rolled out of bed and did. And it was like 11 o'clock. It wasn't like it was later on in the evening. It was earlier in the day. And this guy's hair, I'm telling you, I wish I could have taken a picture. It was absolutely a phenomenal work of art. I mean, seriously, this was a work. You could have taken his hair and put it in a museum and people would have paid money to come see it. It was that amazing. But what was his story? So I'm, I'm thinking about all this. I'm, the Lord's dealing with all this about me. And I see that guy and I go, now I can look at him and go, Oof, what kind of guy is, I mean, he's got black and black and red plaid pants, purple shoes, leather jacket, chains, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, he had two belts on chains and I mean, he had everything you can imagine. Every hand, every finger had a ring on it. I mean, this guy was, this guy was, he had some serious thought in his wardrobe. And I sat and looked at him and I thought, what's his story? What, what's, what's, what's his story that led up to this moment? What is that story? Because you see, we all have a story. You have a story. I've got a story. I didn't just get here today. I'm not just sitting here today talking to you wherever you are as if I've just appeared out of nowhere. I have a story. I've got my own story. You've got your own story. She had her own story. And guess what? In the end, your story matters because her story matters because Jesus looked at her, said to Simon, you didn't do this, but she did this. You didn't do this, but she did this. You didn't do this, but she did this. And then he said this. Therefore, I say to you, watch this. He's still looking at her, but he's talking to Simon. And he looks at her and says, and I say to you, not to her, I say to you, her sins, which are many. He's still talking to her, but he's talking to Simon. He's looking at her, talking to her. He says, am I saying to you, Simon, her sins which are many, are forgiven. Now I wonder when he said that, there was a moment where she went, oh, please don't tell anybody what I've done. Please don't tell anybody. He just said my sins were many. Please don't let anybody know all the stuff I've done. So many of us carry so much shame and regret over things we've done that thankfully today nobody knows the full details. And can I tell you that you, there's a heavenly father that is not interested in exposing you. He's not interested in embarrassing you. He's not interested in pulling the cover off so that we all can look at you and go, man, and any booby, you're such a bad person. You have a heavenly father who's wanting to cover and forgive. And it looked at, he's still looking at her and he says to Simon, her sins, although there many are forgiven. That little three words, which are many, tell me that her story mattered to Jesus. By those three little words, he was letting her know this is not about this moment. This is about the fact that I've seen your story I've seen what you're going through. I know every mistake, but I also know all the hurt and all the pain and all the disappointment and all the things you're going to. Because her story mattered to him. Your story matters to God. Now, the other side of that is like, well, if my story matters to God, then God, why has God allowed my story to go this way? Why? If my story really matters to God, then he's doing a terrible job. You know why your story matters to God? First of all, your story matters to God because your story is unique. Look at this woman. Her story was unique. Nobody had woven through the tapestry of life quite like she had. Even those closest to you that you've experienced the most of life with, even there, 
story is not exactly your story. We all have a unique story. We're all uniquely created by God and all of us have a unique story. So what does that mean? It means this, that my story, because it's unique and it's different, reveals God in a way that no one else has revealed God. Do you realize my story and the uniqueness of my story can show God in a way that others can't? Her story showed something about Jesus Christ that the blind man couldn't show, that the deaf man couldn't show, that the woman who was at the well couldn't show, that, that married the mother Jesus. There were things about her story that were unique to her that when God revealed his work in her life, that the, the power of her story showed an aspect of Jesus Christ that was unique to her and therefore became unique in the in the, in, the, in the testimony of who Jesus Christ is. Do you realize the fact that every hurt, every pain, every difficulty, every situation, every moment of emptiness, all the things that are unique to you reveal or have the potential to reveal an aspect or a nature of God that's unique to your story. You see, the beautiful part about this is, is that her story showed us something about the nature of forgiveness, the fact of even though we have had so much, that God's grace and His mercy and forgiveness is so powerful. Your story is unique. Your story matters because you matter to God. Because your story reveals Maya Angelou said something I found quite to be interesting. Maya Angelou says this, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. The Bible says that we are epistles, meaning letters or examples that have learned and read of all men. That your life, the way it's been written, even though it, you might be in your 70s or 80s or 90s or you may be in your early teens, you may be eight years old watching today that your life is uniquely written and scripted by the Heavenly Father, who Isaiah says knows the end from the beginning. He declares the beginning from the end from the beginning. He starts and knows the whole tapestry of your story from the beginning. And even though sometimes life doesn't go the way we want it to, and life is filled with so much sorrow and so much pain and so much disappointment, that when we let the story be written by the hand of the greatest author, Jesus Christ, that the story written becomes unique and the expression of the love of Jesus Christ through our story is beyond measure. You see, your story matters. And you know what? Your story has the potential to unlock healing. Because here's why. Let's go back to our story. It wasn't just simply about the fact that she was a bad woman and God said to her, bad, 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 naughty, naughty, naughty. Okay, but you're forgiven. That wasn't the nature of God. That wasn't what God was about. The beauty of this whole entire thing was here is a woman who was broken. And I believe that's part of what the the box, the alabaster box rep represented when she broke it. I think that really represented what was really in her own heart. She was broken. But when Jesus looked at her and said, your sins, though they're many, are forgiven. And he said to her something at the end, and this is the unique part about the story. He, go, he says to her at the end, he, he says all this back to, he's looking at her, talking to Simon, and he says, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, now he stopped, he's still looking at her, but instead of talking to Simon, he now directs it to her and he says, your sins are forgiven. And then he said to her at the last, and here's the key. He said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Why did Jesus say go in peace? Think about that. You, you, he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that enough? Wouldn't that have been amazing? If you would have known, I mean, come on right now. Let's say you owe, if you owe 
$10 million right now and you had no ability to pay it off. I mean, you don't have two pennies rubbed together. And I walked up to you and said, listen, I uh, just want to let you know that uh, I talked to the, uh, to the credit creditor and um, you owe $10 million, but um, um, I wanted you to know that your debt is completely forgiven. Let me ask you this. Would you go, yeah, well, thank you. appreciate that. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you very much. How like amazing would you feel? Like how relieved would you feel? How absolutely just, I mean, I, you couldn't even express. I don't know. Some of you were just, maybe some of you are just so like emotionally just flatlined. You'd be like, oh, that's great. I mean, for most of us that are a little fired up, I mean, I'd probably be running around the room. I'd probably hug and slap and grab and kiss and hug and cry. And I mean, I, I'd be, I mean, come on. Oh my God. This is the greatest thing of all time. But then, what's amazing about this whole story is that Jesus could have easily said to her, your sins are forgiven, now go. And she'd have been like, oh, my sins are forgiven, finally. Yes, this is great. But he says something to her that's amazing. He says, go, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Now, this wasn't like we think, well, you know, go, peace out. Peace, peace, go in peace. Live long, prosper. That's why it wasn't that. He wasn't trying to give her some kind of salutation. You know, peace out, my sister. Keep living a real life. You know what I'm saying? Peace. It wasn't that. He wasn't trying to give her the, a salutation. There was something greater because her story now had been picked up by the author and the finisher. He said, your sins are given. Go in peace. What does that mean? Is that God wasn't just trying to take her story and say, well, your story's great. But then her story, he said peace, meaning the internal things of her life, the internal turmoil, the stress, the depression, the fear, the anxiety, all the things in her life that had been brought to the forefront. He said peace, but even greater than that, I believe when he spoke to her and said, go in peace, he really was speaking to her a word of healing to her heart. Because you know what? It's really hard to have peace from a broken place. It's really hard to have peace when your heart is broken. It's really hard to have peace when your world feels shattered. Because peace and wholeness seem to kind of work together. Can you have moments of peace and not be whole? Sure. But the greatest level of peace you'll ever experience is when Jesus Christ makes you whole. When he takes your broken heart and your broken life and he makes it whole again, there's no greater peace than experiencing the peace that comes from forgiveness, but more importantly than forgiveness, from wholeness. He just wasn't trying to forgive her. He was trying to put her back together again. Some of you feel more like Humpty Dumpty than you do anything else. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. I don't know how it goes. I was close enough. I spend more of my life feeling like Humpty Dumpty than I do feeling like there's anything in my life worth saving. But God says to me, your story matters to me. Your story, there's not one thing that I have seen that I have overlooked. There's not one pain, one hurt, one disappointment, one shred of things that, that, has, that you've done or that happened to you that I have not seen or known. Now, I understand for some of you are like, well, if you knew all that, why do you allow it to happen? We can talk about that at another time. But the fact of the matter is, is that God desires to put all of the pieces back together again. Your story matters. Your sins matter. But he ultimately wants to bring peace because your brokenness matters to God. It's not about just simply forgiving you of your sins. I said this to a group this morning. I've said it several times and I will say it again in this moment that God has not come to make bad people good. 
Jesus did not come to make bad people good. If you think or you've been told that the church or Christianity or whatever else or Jesus, whatever, is about making bad people good, then you've been told wrong because God has not come or God does not desire to make bad people good. The Bible says there's none good, no, not one. He's not trying to make you into a good person because you can't make bad into good. That's not the point of it. He has not come to make bad people good. He's come to make dead people live. You and I are dead. The Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sin. We are dead because of the nature of sin. He has not come that we can be bad to good. He's come that we can go from death to to life. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away, old things dead, that all things become new, that all things come to life. He's come to give me life and life more abundantly. God has come to give you life, not the death of depression, not the death of hurt, not the death of, of, of disappointment, not the death of brokenness, not the death of addiction, not the death of, uh, of, 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 of whatever you want to put in that list. God's come that you might have life. And I'm telling you today, just like this woman, you're not just a story on the page of God's timeline. You're not just another character introduced into this whole picture so God can get more glory and credit. Well, isn't Jesus? Whoa, good job, Jesus. Very good. That's all. I, oh, bravo, bravo, bravo. Very good job, Jesus. That was really good. I love how you just, you really, that was great. What a great theater. What great response. No, you matter to God because I kind of tell you this. If that room was full of Pharisees or it would have been an empty room, it would not have mattered to Jesus. Jesus because what really mattered to Jesus was your story matters to me your story matters some people have labeled you already I'm telling you somebody that's watching today you've been labeled people have already said or people look at you because of your well, the way you look or the way you act or your story where you come from maybe the color of your skin or whatever it might be and they label you and they put a label on you and they 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 presume to write your story but can I tell you God knows every aspect of it God knows every aspect of your story and your story matters to God and ultimately your story is unique and it matters don't be ashamed of your story. Don't, don't, don't feel guilt and shame over your story. Have you made mistakes? Yes, but you know what? Get in line. Because you'll be in line behind me. I've made them. Are you perfect? No. Does God want to make you perfect? No. The only one, only person that's perfect, the only thing that's perfect is Jesus Christ. So the only way for me to be perfect is for my life to be hidden in Christ. Because he's the only one that's perfect. But can I tell somebody today, you feel like where, what has been, what, what, of all, what am I supposed to do with all this stuff? What am I supposed to do? Can I tell you, you have a heavenly father that's able to forgive, to set free, and heal. He knows your story already. There's no reason to hide. Don't hide. Our sometimes guilt and our shame and our regret causes us to hide and pull back because we're afraid. We've been rejected so many times and we figure, no, well, we've been rejected. So I figured, you know, I'm sure Jesus will reject me. He won't reject you. He didn't reject her. I'm sure that those men were sitting back waiting, okay, when is he going to kick her out? When is he finally going to know what kind of person this is and he's going to kick her out? And then when he didn't kick her out, he actually accepted her and loved her and forgave her. They were blown away by this. God's not going to reject you. He's going to accept you. God's not going to condemn you. He's going to forgive you. God's not going to hate you. He's going to love you. God's not going to bind you up into some prison of religion. He's going to set you free to have life and life like you've never had before. He's going to give you peace and joy and happiness. Your story matters. I don't know who all this was for today. But I feel like somebody, God has brought you to this moment today because he wants you to know you matter to him. Your story matters to him. He doesn't see a woman who's bad and evil and full of sin. He sees somebody that's full of love, that's full of worship, that's looking at Jesus Christ and going, I have nowhere else to turn 
and you're my last hope. But everything that I've got, even down to this alabaster box, I'm giving it to you. And Jesus looked at her and said, be forgiven, but more importantly, be made whole. Jesus, you're so full of love and kindness and gracious and mercy. I don't know who is watching today, but I know there's somebody that's watching that is needed to hear these words today because they live in torment and fear and regret, hopelessness, because their life up to this point hasn't gone like they think it should. Life has been filled with more turns and dips and disappointments than we even know what to do with. Instead of being written like a Hollywood epic, it feels more like a horror story written on the pages of time. But Lord, you know all, you see all, and more importantly, you desire to let us know the reality of you and your love. You don't condemn, you forgive. You don't push away, you pull to. Your word says you draw near to those who are brokenhearted, who have a crushed and wounded spirit. God, many of us today are dealing with broken places in our heart. Many of us today are dealing with crushed places in our hearts and our spirits. We feel, many days we feel hopeless. We put a smile on for everybody else, but God, only you know the true way we feel inside. Only you know the emptiness that we deal with. Only you know the hurt that we try to bury beneath the smiles and the good times on the outside. But on the inside, we feel so lost, so empty, so hopeless. But God also, your word time and time again expresses how much you love and care about us. It expresses how much that our story matters to you, that we're not just one of 7.8 billion to you, but we're truly one of one, that no one else was alive on this earth today, and it was just us, that you would love us with the same passion as you love everyone, that we matter to you, not because we're one of many, but we matter to you because we are truly one of one, created and fashioned by your hands down to the very fingerprints and the DNA strands inside of us that carry our own uniqueness. We are created and fashioned by you in that uniqueness. And our story is unique, but you, God, you are unique. You're one of a kind. There's no, no, no other God like you. You are great. You are powerful. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. There's none like you, but more importantly, God, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same Jesus that we read about on these pages is the same Jesus that is still alive. And you are that Jesus. And we confess and believe that you are that God. And that we confess and believe that you're able to make yourself real and known to us even now in Jesus' name. If you would feel comfortable, I wonder if you would just in your own words, just, in, just for just a moment, just close your eyes and I say, why, why am I closing my eyes? Are you trying to, trying to make this spooky? No, I say close our, close our eyes because sometimes when our eyes are open, we get very distracted. So I close my eyes sometimes because it allows me to focus. And, and, and you don't have to get down on your knees to talk to God. You don't have to get in some kind of prayer posture. There's nowhere in the Bible that says your hands have to be together like this. It's prayer simply a conversation. Prayer simply talking out, talking to God out loud. It's not just thinking it in your mind, but it's actually speaking it with your mouth. And I wonder if you could just take a moment right where you're at and just express yourself to Jesus. He's listening. Literally, he is listening right now and he's waiting for you to talk to him. And would you just tell God, tell him and be honest. I mean, just if it, if you got to be raw, be raw. Say, God, my life stinks. My life's terrible. I, I'm I don't know if I even want to keep living if life is supposed to be like this. And God, I, I've heard this guy talk for the last hour, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm willing to try it because I'm desperate for something to change. Be honest. You don't have to say those exact words, but, I mean, tell God exactly how you feel. Might as well not hold back. He already knows. He told that lady, he said, your sins are many. He knew it. He knows it all. He already knew all the sins. He already knows everything you're going through. 
So instead of worrying about God rejecting you, he already knows. So he's, if he's listening, he's already accepted you. He's not rejected you, but he's waiting for you. Remember, I talked to you in the very beginning. Stands at the door, knock. Would you open the door to Jesus Christ today and let Jesus Christ, let Jesus Christ have an opportunity to show you today who he is. Guess what? It's not about me. I'm on this side of the camera. You're on that side of your device, whether it's a TV, a phone, an iPad, whatever you're watching for, or you're on your computer. I'm on this side, you're on that side. So it's not me that's gonna do this for you. It's about you and Jesus Christ. And wherever you're watching, he's just as real there as he is anywhere. He's just waiting for you to acknowledge. And maybe all you can conjure up in your mind is just say this, Jesus. Just close your eyes and just say that. Say Jesus. And I guarantee you, the Bible says if you call upon his name, he would hear you. He's listening now. Would you call upon him? He's listening. He's waiting. He's anticipating for you to call upon him. Just call him. He's there. But he's waiting for you to open the door today in Jesus' name.